Hello and welcome to Cleggan webinar on the overview of the upcoming ECHA, European Chemical Agency, REACH, SVHC, Substance of Very High Concern Database. A lot of acronyms in one shot there. I'm Bruce Calder. I'm the VP of Consulting Services here at Cleggan. So very full agenda, a lot of detail, I like to think. So we're going to have a short introduction and then we're going to talk a little bit about the EU recalls in 2019. We've talked to a lot of people about the recalls in 2018 and how restricted materials are Recalls are gaining steam. We'll talk about the first quarter of 2019 and where things are at. Uh, then we'll talk, go into reach Article 33 or the SVHC provision. We'll talk about the legal requirement to communicate substance of very high concern. What's the definition of an article? What are some high risk materials? We'll give an example of the current reach SVHC declaration. A reach SVHC declaration is mandatory for any product, any component that contains a reach SVHC above 0.1% by weight. Then we're going to the more the going forward, the European Chemical Agency Reach SVHC database. A little overview, a little summary of the data requirements, a lot of data details, right? And inundate you with details. There's still some fine points that need to be worked out. We should know by this summer. Um, but right now, with everything's available so far, I'll explain the details and show some example outputs. And then we're gonna have a brief sojourn, uh, talk about all the problems of full material declarations and why you shouldn't do them, and then a bunch of the more practical solutions. So the webinar should take around 50 minutes and about 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, please feel free to submit it into the uh, question section in the sidebar, and I'll try to get to as many as possible. There are tons of questions this morning. Um, it's a very complex topic and there's the devils and the details and I'll try to help as much as I can. So, uh, of course, one of the ways we can help, we can do a couple things. We're a pretty high volume testing lab. We're really good at this kind of thing. We test for each SVHCs in complex products all the time, plus new ROHS requirements, including the phthalate restrictions that kick in for regular electronics. Uh, July of this year, reach SVHCs, of course, persistent organic pollutants. That SCCP is, is a real problem child, causing lots of recalls. And then Prop 65, of course. But one of the other things we also do is training and education on site. And I'll go into it a tiny bit more detail later. But it's about half a day, or a little less than half a day in education. Like this stuff. What are the rules? What are the high-risk materials? How do you actually do this in practice? So educational. And the other half is very hands-on, where we actually take your products with you and show you the high-risk materials and the likely SVHCs and create a declaration. One of the things about REACH SVHC, it's not a restriction. It's not a ban. You just have to declare it. And as long as you declare you're compliant. So we show you how to do that, especially when you're dealing with legacy products. New products usually have a compliance budget. Legacy products, less so, and you have to be infinitely practical. So I'll explain how that's done. Then we do more Q&A, of course, at the end. So um, one of the really popular things we do, we definitely top rated thing we do by far, I mean, testing is excellent, but is the on-site training, education, and then doing the hands-on, showing you and your engineers and your design team, et cetera, what materials, what are you going to declare, where in their product, what is it, touch and feel. It's far more tangible. So uh, first little diversion to EU recalls. Um, well, I've been talking to in 2018, it was the first year restricted materials recalls uh, got past electrical safety or the low voltage directive for LVD. Um, and that's accelerated a lot in Q1. Q1, now restricted materials have almost twice as many recalls as electrical safety. Electrical safety is still very important. I mean, your product bursting in a fire is not a good thing. Um, and EMC, of course, hasn't had a recall since 2015. We're going to talk about restricted materials. And this has a lot to do with the European Chemical Agency's enforcement forum. They have a mandate and funding to train the investigators in each country and enable them and create capability in those countries so they actually for enforce. And we're seeing a lot of that now. How those recalls. About a third is ROHS, about a third is reach, uh, reach restrictions, and about a third is POP, primarily the short chain chlorinated paraffins, which are super, super common. So um, this is a really good slide, especially when you're dealing with an executive that may have the attention span of a flea when it comes to restricted materials. It's always worth showing them this. This is why we're doing it. We can talk about, you know, the good of the environment and all that cool stuff, but the recall risk is very significant and getting worse. I mean, last year, restricted materials just Past electrical safety, now it's almost two to one and accelerating. So back to the main topic, uh, the substance of concern database. So under the new EU waste directive framework, manufacturers to have to register any product that contains an SVHC and the SVHC is contained within in IUCLID, the European Chemical Agency's database, by January 5th, 2021. So that the requirement itself is in the, the waste um, directive framework 
it's a new waste regulation or directive, sorry. Um, so funding, so just an update on the whole thing. Funding's been secured for the database development. That was the only thing holding it back. Uh, European Chemical Agency wanted the funding. They got their funding. Everything's a go. There's also political will behind it. The waste providers in the EU came out and said, yeah, this is a really good idea. Um, right now, the EU Enforcement Forum is doing a massive reach SVHC enforcement project, which just finished last year. Uh, one of the expected outcomes, they say, you know what? The data is not regularly available. The format's not regularized. We really need a database. So funding's there. Political will's there. It's all on track. They're supposed to have the first full system ready by next year. There's a slight delay in the funding getting approved, so it may be slightly late. There's a possibility the Jan 5th deadline might be pushed back, but right now it is not. Um, it's currently and legally, the requirement is to register products containing SVHCs in the database by January 5th, 2021. There might be a a delay or a um, period of grace if they have data, if they continue to have database delays, but the European Chemical Agency is pretty darn good at making database. They've been doing reach registration for years. They're great at creating specifications. It's actually a very capable organization in space. This isn't an org that's doing it for the first time. They have a tremendous background in software specification, software writing for this kind of thing. Um, the chance of them being that late are probably very small. So where this all comes from is originally REACH regulation, Article 33 is a requirement summarized here. Suppliers of articles must communicate REACH SVHC subsidiary concern, also called the candidate list, above 0.1% by weight in an article um, to their customer. Suppliers of consumer products to the end consumer have a 45-day window. So the consumer asks the retailer, the retailer's 45 days respond. But in a business-to-business -business transaction, like a sale to a retailer or distributor does not count. It needs to be available at the time of the sale. You need to be able to communicate it. So it used to be the article used to be defined as basically a laptop or a car, the finished product. But there was a court case, the European Court of Justice in 2015 said, no, no, no. Cars and refrigerators and that kind of thing are complex articles made up of simple articles, components, and the declar declarations at the component level, at the resistor level, at the connector level, at the component level, not the finished product level. Now, technically, this is the delta. A... If your component has a safety data sheet, like it's glue or solder or paint, it's not an article. It's still a chemical. It's controlled by safety data sheet. Um, SVHCs get declared in the safety data sheet, but they don't have this Article 33 SVHC communication requirement. Components no longer have a safety data sheet. So once the material no longer has safety data sheet, now it's a screw or hookup wire resistor, um, that's that's the declarable level, the first time that occurs. Now, we can talk metaphysically, but that connector is made of a bunch of articles, and you can. It usually ends up being sort of a human being looking at, is that a component? So usually a connector is one part. It's really at a component level. Now, some people might say, hey, look, my external power supply is a component. No, they'll say that's made of many components. When in doubt, totally rule of thumb. If it's below one gram, uh, probably don't get too chuffed about it. And it gets really untestable. You take a thick film resistor, which is a milligram or less, on a board. Good luck testing for anything anyways. It has requirements, but good on you if you can get a real measurement for any organics in something that small. So there is a level of practicality. Technically, it's what it no longer has a safety data sheet. It becomes a component. In practice, human beings are involved, and it's basically a screw or a connector or a resistor or hookup wire type level. It's not a modulus materials. It's at a component level. So back when it used to be declarable, SPHCs used to be declarable at a finished product level, like a laptop or refrigerator, there were very few SPHCs that would be above 0.1% by weight in, say, a laptop. There weren't that high concentration. One of the exceptions, the ortho phthalates. These are the phthalates that make PVC bend. PVC is normally rigid, like your water piping. And the way you make it bend is you get a plasticizer, historically the phthalates, and they get between the vinyl chloride strands and push them farther apart. They call technically what's called swelling. They get between the vinyl chloride strands and push them farther apart. By pushing them farther apart, they become more flex, uh, fluid and flexible and bend. Uh, another example of this, if you take a sponge and the sponge is completely dry and it's hard and you can't really bend it if you need to crack it, but if you fill it up with water, it swells and the separation is much larger and then you can actually bend it. It's somewhat related. It's called swelling. But uh, historically, the, the phthalates, the ortho phthalates, have been the plasticizers in PVC and nitrile rubber, Buna N and Buna S and neoprene forever. 
there are new replacements, especially the terephthalates. Terephthalates are not nearly as harmful. Um, but when the orthophthalates are used, they're generally high concentration. They really don't do a lot below, you know, unless they're in high concentration. So normally they're 5 to 30% of the weight of the PVC. So a very, very high concentration. 1,2-dimethyloxoethane, or EGDME, is one of the main solvents in lithium button cell batteries. It's 1 to 4% of the button cell battery. You can see it right in the safety data sheet. Uh, very common, high concentration SVHC. The UV stabilizers, the benzotriazoles families, basically plastics are not normally UV stable. So, for example, if you look at your water bottle, if you have a water bottle at your desk, and you look, hey, look, it's transparent. Light can go through it. Yes, visible light goes through it, but uh, UV light does not. It gets blocked and absorbed. And the UV spectrum gets blocked and absorbed by most plastics, then it has to dissipate the energy, and usually by chemical change or aging or discolor. So um, outdoor rated or UV stabilized plastics often use a UV stabilizer, of which this, these four were fairly common. And since they're usually in the outer enclosures of outdoor products or UV rated products, they're pretty high uh, concentration over the product. The other one that was common in high concentrations is TRIS. Tris-2-chloroethyl phosphate, TCP. It's one of the main flame retardants in polyurethane foam. So if you go to the baby car seat in your car, they, it's the common flame retardant in the baby car seat um, in the, the, the foam inside. Uh, there's a good reason the car is full of gasoline or now often lithium. Um, it burns quite well. You need a tremendous amount of flame retardant to make sure the baby seat doesn't burn very easily. And so that's where this comes in. So it'll be 20% of the weight of the foam. So also very high concentration. Now the declarables, the component level, brings in tons. One of the most common is PVC components and hookup wires. You have phthalates and SCCPs. Now you can't, SC, short chain chlorinated paraffins or SCCPs are reach SVHCs, but you can't declare them. Everything else we're going to talk about here doesn't apply to them. They're banned in Europe and they're banned in Canada at 0.15%. Um, above that level, it's a recall issue. About a third of those recalls we talked about in the EU were this chemical. It's a bioaccumulant. It's banned under the UN Stockholm Convention, but only banned at a country level in the European Union and in Canada. It is a very common secondary plasticizer, which is a fancy name for an extender, which is a fancy name for something that makes orthophthalates work better. So orthophthalates um, cost a certain amount of money, and they're one of the cheaper ways to make PVC bend. The way to make it super cheap is you add a chlorinated paraffin 52%, uh, CP52. It uh, basically halves the cost of the plasticizer, gives you much cheaper PVC. The, SCC, the SCCPs in it um, enable the orthophthalates to be more compatible with PVC and bend. So bend for about half the price. And so we see it very commonly in cheap PVC. Well, chlorinated paraffins 52 will come up again later. Um, SCCPs and short-chain chlorinated paraffins and medium-chain chlorinated paraffins and long-chain chlorinated paraffins have a really neat regulatory names and chemical names, but they're totally not what's sold in the outside world. Chlorinated paraffins are controlled by chlorine content. The most common being CP52, chlorinated paraffin 52%. Um, it doesn't mean it, and on average, that's medium-chain chlorinated paraffins. But it's only on average. They only control the chlorinated paraffin by chlorine content. They have every kind of paraffin you can think of in there. And CP52 is usually 20% SCCPs, and that's why it turns up. So we tested on the open market over five countries, 253 flexible PVC samples. 29% failed for SCCPs. Every single one of them will be a recall issue. This stuff is super, super common. And everything else we talk about here, you only have to declare. As long as you declare reach SVHCs, you're compliant. This is a reach SVHC, it's banned. You gotta be careful about this one. It's the one I'm gonna come back to bite you. One of the fundamental rules of restricted materials compliance, the things you're most likely to be non-compliant for, are the things you didn't know about. SCP, SCCPs is a big time risk. It's a bigger recall risk than RHS by a large amount. It's a significant deal. Um, bisphenol A, a lot of people focus on polycarbonate, but polycarbonate, which is made from bisphenol A, is usually fully reactive. It's only a trace amount of BPA left over. Where we actually see it in higher concentrations is an antioxidant to the plasticizers in extruded PVC. It's much higher concentrated concentration there. Nitrile rubber and PVC gaskets and soft parts, phthalates, making a bend. PVC labels, most vinyl labels are flexible. Not the polyester ones, they're flexible too, but they're not phthalated. Uh, PVC labels often used for safety are very commonly phthalated. That's how they bend. Electrical tape, phthalates, and trixyl phosphate, or triziol phosphate, depending on how you want to say it. Um, the label adhesives often have the suffractant nonalphenol phoxlate, MPEO. However, eh, you could argue the adhesive is a chemical and not calculable. Any SVHC in it is not calculable until it's adhered onto the product. Super common one is PZT, piezo, lead zirconate titanate. PZT is one of the main buzzers or transducers, super common, a little white disc. 
inside a little electrode there. Um, it's a, almost 100% PZT. Very common declarable, but it's not banned. You just have to declare. As long as you say my buzzer contains PZT, you're compliant about 0.1%. Captain, elastane, spandex, the non-woven fibers are made using a solvent called DMAC, one of the aprotic salt polar solvents. Um, it's usually residual in those materials, still about 0.1%. So often these the captons of the world and spandex and elastanes have residual DMAC. ADCA is sort of a really common newer discovery. So when you make bread, you, you have to use yeast, and yeast makes it rise. So you add the yeast to the bread, and the bread rises. And the way the yeast works is it eats the sugar, consumes the sugar, and releases carbon dioxide, which creates air bubbles in the bread, causing the bread to rise. And then you bake it, and you have this beautiful fluffy bread that's got all these little pockets in it. That's from the carbon dioxide produced by the yeast. Plastics work differently. So closed cell foam uses ADCA. Different, so two different major types of foam, open cell and closed cell. Open cell are like the polyurethane foam we talked about on the previous page. It lets air pass through it. The cells are not complete. They're open and air can pass through it. So your chair you're sitting on right now probably has open cell foam. You sit in it, air passes through it. It goes whoosh. Um, that's open cell foam. You could blow through it. You put it up to your face. You probably don't want to sit there with your coworker sitting around with your face down on your chair, proving you can blow through it. But that's open cell foam. If you want to use closed cells, the other type, this one you can't blow through. So it's EVA foam or polypropylene foam or polyethylene foam, like your pool noodles. You try to pick a pool noodle up, try to blow through it, you're just going to get blue in the face. The air won't pass. It's closed cell plastic. <clears throat> to make closed cell plastic, they usually use ADCA. And what it does is it combines with water and heat and releases nitrogen gas and creates nitrogen bubbles, N2 bubbles. And that basically causes the, the plastic to rise or foam and creates your plastic version of bread. The EVA foam and polypropylene foam or whichever has all these little closed cell pockets in it for the nitrogen gas being released by the ADCA being consumed. In the initial mixture, the ADCA is about 20% of the weight of the EVA material. Once it's fully foamed, most of it should be reacted away, but there's not great stats on it. So considering it starts at 20%, usually it might be still above 0.1. It's an interesting problem and not well documented. Something we're looking into. One of the, the two newer sets of SVHCs are super common, lead in metals. So lead in brass, lead in steel, lead in aluminum, which are all allowed under ROHS to certain levels. Um, but they'll be above 0.1% by weight very commonly. And they're not banned. You just have to declare them. As long as you meet in electronics, the ROHS exemption, you can have lead up to the allowed percentage for each material. But it's declarable. Now, this is lead metal, lead Glass, like a diode or resistors, lead, leaded glass, which is a different chemical number. This is only lead as a lead metal or lead in alloys. Lead oxide is also an SVHC, but a diode's leaded glass, and leaded glass is a separate chemical number from lead oxide. So for technical reasons, the lead in diodes or optical glass or resistors are not declarable SVHCs. The lead in brass, steel, and aluminum, or high temp solder for that matter, are all declarable. Uh, SVHCs. The other one which is quite surprising is in silicone rubber. It's the building block. Silicone rubber is usually made from cyclosiloxane monomers, particularly D6 cyclosiloxane. And when you, if you actually look at the safety data sheet from the pre, from the uh, pre unmolded silicone fluid, the cyclosiloxanes will be well above the 0.1% declarable level. But after it's full, it's polymerized, it often drops below. But usually the D6 is still around 700 to 900 ppm. Be amazed how common the D6 cyclosiloxane is in silicone rubber. Um, it's the building block and it remains residual very close to the 1000 ppm declarable limit and sometimes goes above. So the cyclosiloxanes are also extremely common SVHC, maybe even the most common after lead metal. We see it all the time. Now, are they above 1,000 ppm? Not on the majority of time, but enough to matter considering how common they are. So these are now, now that we're at a component level, there's a lot more high risk SVHCs. And pretty well any complex product is going to have declarable SVHCs. There are just too many of them. So an interesting, we're going to have a little diversion, interesting about the world. It's always fun in amongst all this regulatory gobbledygook talk about the world, such that it is. Um, moisturizers and conditioners. Strangely enough, for some time, um, moisturizers and conditioners no longer really moisturize or condition. What they actually do is they coat the skin or hair with silicone gel. The silicone gel keeps the water in and lets air pass through it. So most 
moisturizers and conditioners now are, are silicone gel under their sexier names of dimethicone or decamethylcyclopentosiloxane D5. That's the D5 new SVHC. So if anybody's sitting at their desk and has a moisturizer sitting there and want to have a good time, you flip it around and look at the ingredients list and chances are, unless you've been really careful, it'll say dimethicone or the cyclopentosiloxane. That's silicone rubber. So what you make your spatula from now is now what they use for moisturizers and conditioners. It's harmless to humans. It just coats it. It's one of the reasons why you use silicone spatulas is they don't react with much. However, the fact they don't react with much is a bit of a problem. When they get out in the environment, the uh, animals can't process it. Fish can't process it. It's silicone rubber. You start force feeding a fish your silicone spatula, it's not going to work out so hot. And, this is, and so they're a bioaccumulant, which means they're not a Prop 65 substance, but our reach SVHC is a bioaccumulant. The way they get in the system really is they go down the drain primarily, um, get caught in the biomass, which is a sexy name for poo, and then it gets redistributed as fertilizer and gets back in the, the supply chain. So it's kind of neat. So if anybody has any moisturizer, if you go home, look at your conditioner, and the products here are, are it's right in their ingredients list. So it's nothing really special here. Um, and that's the moisturizer conditioners are primarily now just silicone gel. So people, uh, you know, look down on people who had, you know, breast implants and silicone and all that kind of stuff historically. Well, now people spread it all over their body. The other one is makeup. One of the main ingredients for a lot of underlayers, especially for facial makeup, is Teflon-based materials, either PTFE or C9 to 15 fluoro alcohol phosphate, which is another floral polymer. So if you get a, if it's, it says your makeup is silky, that's Teflon or Teflon derivative, where they're putting a floral polymer, it makes it waterproof, it's, you know, everything Teflon is. People worry about Teflon pans, which is hilarious because the makeup is the same stuff. And the, the fluorinated phosphate itself breaks down into PFOA. So PFOA is also banned in Europe come July of next year. It's a reach SVHC and it's a new Prop 65. The first Prop 65 um, prosecutions for PFOA are like the product listed here and many others like it. It's pretty typical of the fluoro alcohol phosphates. Now, the prosecutions have been completed. There's no settlements, but that's the people looking at it. They're not going after Teflon frying pans or Teflon wires for PFOA. They're going after makeup first because one of the main chemicals, C9 to 15, the fluoro alcohol, um, looks like it actually degrades right into PFOA all by itself. But it's kind of neat, and we'll get back to the regulatory stuff, where you're looking at a lot of the makeups and really a lot of the silky texture. When you watch a commercial on TV and you say silky, that's Teflon. It's kind of neat. And, and, tef, and PFOA is a bioaccumulant and a carcinogen, therefore reach SVHC and Prop 65. Now, these are mostly mixtures, so they're not governed by this reach SVHC declaration, but it's an interesting diversion. Sorry about that. Back to the regulatory stuff. Um, so this is an example of a current reach SVHC declaration. Now, there is no single format. There's not even any kind of required format for each SVHC declarations right now. Article 33 has no format requirements. Even the guidance says you can kind of maybe do things look like these four examples um, and aren't very specific. And that's one of the reasons why they're putting the database in. The communication method was never really nailed down. So, um, but this is a decent example of a current one. Where it's basically saying, hey, um, this company, Acme, had the duty to communicate to a customer the presence of SVHCs in excess of 0.1% by weight of articles. As defined by the Court of Justice of European Union, case C-10614. That's the fancy way of saying we're doing it at the component level. We're saying it's the court case in 2015 that says it's at the component level, not the finished product level. Acme reviewed its products. Now, as long as you're honest, you can say it reviewed its products. You can say it's for this product. You can say it's for this family product. There's no prescribed way that you have to um, declare, as long as it's honest. You say, hey, look, our products do not contain... Any of the 197 SVHCs as of the 15th of January 2019 list, except as noted below. One of the key things is you want to be honest. At reach SVHC is not a restriction. It's not a ban. It is a communication. As long as you communicate, you're compliant. And having this communication for products that contain SVHCs is mandatory. You're not allowed to sell without it. The only reason people are often getting away with it or using the manana approach, and I'll get to it tomorrow, is enforcement is only ramping up. And there isn't a good communication model. The database is going to change that. You need to have a declaration. If you do not have one, you cannot sell. Now, if the product has no SVHCs, legitimately you don't need one. Uh, but any, almost every complex product has at least one SVHC. So this determination is based on engineering evaluation, testing, and supplier declarations and is correct to the best of Acme Company's knowledge, corporation knowledge. Um, which the part of this is you want to make this 
honest. If you're basing it on something, say what you're basing it on. The main things that have the declaration, if there's an error in it and you're honest about the limitations, there's basically no punishment for it. So for example, down below, internal, external cables and, and or wires may contain DHP. So the requirement is the component and the SVHC. As long as you do that, you can't say my product may contain SVHCs. That's not the requirement. Requirements, what component contains what SVHC? Our silicon components and materials may contain uh, D6, D5, and D4, with that big, long cycle cell oxane names, um, which is not uncommon for silicon components. And often they're just under 1,000 ppm, so may contain some really fair enough um, comment because it varies a little bit. My brass, aluminum, steel components contain lead above 0.1% by weight or may contain, really in some cases, some will and some won't. My EVA foam may contain ACDA, CC, azodiformamide. I know it's a big, long chemical names, and sometimes you use their alternative names, and I apologize. I also apologize for speaking really quickly, which brings me to a little point. Every single person who registered will receive a copy of the slides, and we should have a recording of this available on our website in the next couple of days. So the fact that I'm talking at Mach 2, hopefully uh, there's a way to go back. Unfortunately, I can't slow down the presentation later, uh, but I have a lot of material to go through, and one of the nice things about hopefully in this presentation, if you have questions, please feel free to submit, and I'll try to get to as many as possible. And you can also ask questions to me afterwards. Um, so back to this. Again, there is no re prescribed, required communication format. You just have to have it available at the time of sale. You could argue that there's no proactive requirement. It just has to be there. Um, and there's a lot of technicalities around that. And a lack of detail. There's not, nothing the law says how or when or what format needs to be provided. So today, it often looks like this. As long as you declare, you're compliant. So one of the things you often have to bring back to your business unit saying, hey, look, our silicon components may contain D4, D5, D6. Are you cool with this? Because if you are, as long as we declare, we're compliant. If you don't like this, I can do work, i.e. spend more money, and to determine if we do for sure and control it. So determine if you have something is not as important as controlling it. If it's not part of your supplier spec, Good luck with this. Um, whatever data you have is often people do whatever it needs to keep you off their back. Um, you really need it as part of the design spec. But if the market goes, you know what, I don't care if we declare these substances, you're like, good, we're compliant. One of the fundamental rules, one of the other fundamental rules of restricted materials compliance is the restricted materials prime can do anything they want as long as it's free, of which most of the time it isn't. So if you make a declaration, you're compliant. So and, mar and so if marketing or the business decides, you know what, I really don't really want to declare this, great. It just takes more work, i.e. effort and money to solve this. But the compliance requirement is to declare. Now, this is changing over from the paper format or basically unclear format to a database. So you're basically taking what you have in paper today or should have in paper or legally required to have in paper to the electronic form. You're already required to have this. This is one of the reasons why some people are like, well, it's not going to get through. It's too hard to do. Guess what? You've had it for the last almost decade now. You've been doing it. You've been legally required to do it for years. There's no sympathy. And you say, well, you know, the article level is very – you've had years. The fact you actually have to put in a database now and do it kind of suggests you haven't actually been doing it the whole time. Um, so the main difference is what you're taking – you're taking what's on paper and putting electronic form. And it's going to be – it's primarily for waste processors, but it will be available for consumers. Now, it's stuck in there under waste, but it's really for consumers. The consumers will be able to access it. We do not know the details, but part of this data is for consumers. They'll, we're not sure exact format, but it looks like they'll be able to access it, which also means news organizations will be able to access it. It's an interesting part of the whole thing. So this is taking what you have on paper and putting in a database. And that's one of the reasons why there's sm less legal barriers to do so because it's already required to be done. They're just creating a format. So oversimplification this is kind of what it looks like in the database. We're going to get more details by this summer, which is a very undefined time frame. Um, it is not like July 15th. No, it's, they said this summer, which if it's not by August, there's not a lot of people there off the European agencies in August. So maybe it's not September, but the ECA is actually very, very good at defining things and requirements. It is not impossible. It's out in July. Um, September, probably the latest. They'll go into more technical detail, but they've provided quite a bit so far. And this is kind of what we're looking at. We take a complex product like a refrigerator. And if this is your refrigerator, I apologize. We just pick one off the web. Um, refrigerator. And that's a complex product. 
That's one being sold on the, on the market. Now, the thing about the declarable level is anything that's sold in the EU. So if you sell a component in the EU, it has to go here because it's anything you transfer to a recipient. So if your component or your, which is a product or your more complex product or your refrigerator has a declarable SVHC, it'll have to go in the database by Jan 5th, 2021. If it has no SVHCs, it actually doesn't have to go here. But in some case, a lot of cases, companies will just put it here anyways just to make life easier and say no SVHCs. So we'll take a complex product like the refrigerator, and then for each component that has an SVHC, you have to declare the SVHC in that component. You do not have to declare SVHCs in components that do not have uh, – you don't have to include in components that don't have SVHCs. So the fact that the refrigerator has uh, hundreds of parts in it, we're only saying the brass standoffs have lead – and the silicone washers have D6 cycloxane. And the fact that it has an aluminum door doesn't matter because aluminum is, if it doesn't have lead in it, it doesn't have any declarables. So the only declarables we're seeing in this one are the leads, the brass standoffs with lead in them, and the silicone washers with D6. And that's the way it looks. And it's very similar to this paper version saying, here's a product, our declarables are, we have to create an object for wires and saying DHP, which of course in regular electronics is banned in July of this year under ROHS, but it's a good example. Our silicone components uh, contain D, D4, D5, D6. And it'll primarily be D6. It's the highest concentration of the three. And that's basically what it looks like. Now, we're going to provide a lot more detail as we go through this. By the way, this is just giving you a starting point. I don't want to throw the whole kitchen sink at you guys. So um, the way it works is you're going to have to declare by complex product or basically anything you transfer to someone else with a sub-declaration for each component in it that has declarable SVHC. And the sub-component can be somebody specific. It can be Molex part 1, 2, 3, 4. Or you can create a brass standoff object. Or you can make a brass component object, as long as it's honest. A lot of companies use more generic ones because they'll have alternative parts. Um, they don't necessarily want to say they're buying from. Um, especially the alternative part section. Or they have a lot of parts that are very similar and they'd rather put them under the same umbrella. You know, our brass components may con uh, contain lead about 0.1% by weight. So you would create these sub-objects and then you attach them to your complex object. Now you have the ability, one of the things that's going to cause some people some problems is uh, a lot of complex product manufacturers will say, hey, or some read this, hey, wait a minute, all I have to do is get the ID in the database of each one of my supplier's components and I'll just attach them to my product. So they give you an Excel list of every part they buy from you and want your... Uh, ECHA database ID so they can attach them, which is a bit overkill and then they're completely vulnerable to the slow supplier. And a really bad idea, but it's still going to happen. Um, you're going to, as component suppliers, my apologies, you're going to get somebody contacting you with an Excel list of every part they buy from you and want to know the ECHA database ID number. This is going to make your job awesome. Now, nice on the bright side, once you get in there once, you're good to go. Um, in terms of mass upload, the IUCLID has the ability to do things like mass uploads. They just have to write it for this. And it'll be like an XML format where you can upload a lot of parts once. It's not written in any of the documentation right now, but the IUCLID system normally has this capability. And I'm sure they can write it when they get to it. Right now, all we know, you can do it manually. It should have the ability to do bulk, but right now manually. So the main data is administrative or legal entity data, then the article and complex object data like we just saw. This complex object has these sub-articles in it, which have SVHCs. The SVHC, often called the candidate list substance, legally it's called the candidate list substance, not reach SVHC, inside each component that has a declarable SVHC, and then the safe use information. So it's really four sets of data. So administrative details are like the company name, the company's contact details, which are mandatory, and the company's UUID number. So when you register into the IUCLID, you get a UUID. That's your unique identifier for the company. And that'll be attached um, confidentially to anything you write. And you'll be, that's how you're tracked. You're tracked by a number. Um, and then the contact person details are optional if you want to add a contact person for it. When you do the product identification, you need its complete trade name. You need an internationally recognized number or code, like a barcode or UBC code or a QR code or a, a recognized internet unique code or ID for it. The brand, you can put option, you can, it's NA if you want optional, it can be the model or type. And then any other identifiers, picture, weight, dimensions, quantity, color. Um, they'll also normally ask for its uh, HS code or UN code, the customs code for it. So the way they categorize complex objects like refrigerators, 
is often be by the, the CN or HS or UN. They're all the same. Customs code are basically the same. The customs code will show whether the object's used by workers or consumers. Is it a commercial fridge? Is it a consumer fridge? And the identification of each sub-article containing SVHC. Again, you only have to list the components that have SVHCs in it, the SVHC that's in it, and the safe use information. So this is what we talked about a minute ago. We got this refrigerator, complex product, has brass standoffs that have lead, have silicon washers that have D6-cycloceloxane. Awesome. So when you do that structure, for each of the sub-articles, if it's a you either have to identify the material and the drop down menus, or again, it's customs code. So you can use a brass standoff, use a standoff custom code as one for that, or you can just use brass, which is metal and then copper uh, alloy. For example, material, if you're doing a PVC material, saying, hey, it's our PVC cable, it's plastic, thermoplastic, PVC, it's three levels. That's how you identify the subcomponent. We'll show an example in a minute, whether or not it's used by workers or consumers, and then the SVHC range, which is a bit odd. This is the only part where it kind of diverts a little bit from legal requirement, which is declare above 0.1% by weight. And we're not sure how enforceable it is for you to pick the right band here, because the legal requirements only need to declare that it is above 0.1% by weight, just not, not say how much, but they're big, wide open ranges, and it shouldn't be terribly hard. And then any applicable safe use information. So I'm sure you took all this in. Everybody remember the test later. No, there's not. The, the unique, no, sorry, the customs code. So when you got a product like a refrigerator or a pencil sharpener is the example they use. Here's its customs code. You can see how it goes from office equipment to office supplies, desk supplies, and then a pencil sharpener. Manual pencil sharpener is 44121619. That's the customs code. That's the commodity. So you can use, if you have, say, a standoff, you can get the commodity code for a standoff and put that in as the identifier what type of component it is. It's all by customs code. Or you can do by material. You can instead of doing brass standoff, you can do brass. So the upper level is based on the R12 guidance of ECHA. So it's like stone, ceramic, paper, plaster, fiber, rubber, cement, so on and so forth. Metal. So brass will be under metal. Plastics, imagine you're doing silicone, it's under plastics, thermoset, silicone. Silicone to thermoset. I know this is very exciting chemistry for everybody. Uh, PVC is a thermoplastic, silicone is a thermoset. Uh, I can it's kind of an uh, explanation of what's the difference between the two of them for another time. Um, so they take a refrigerator and it's model XXX and there's customs code 84182100 and I believe this is one for consumer refrigerator. And then you should have its barcode or UPC code or also unique identifier, which I didn't put here. And then it, here's the brass standoff again. And we're saying it's metal, metal copper metal alloy. And it's got lead between 1% to 5%. Normally under ROHS, it will be around the 3% range. Usually lead and brass around 3%. There are other options, but usually it's around 3 and a bit percent. Then there's a the silicone washer, which is plastic, thermoset, silicone. Silicone's under thermoset, thermoset's under plastic. Um, and then the, the declarable is cyclosiloxane, which would be just above 0.1% if it's there, between 0.1% and 0.2%. So this is a more specific Entry. So now we went from here's the objects. Now this is what other data you need to put into it. Here's the model number. You actually get the UPC code, which is not here, or barcode. Another unique number identifier. It's customs code, which is the 84 number. And then each component. I'm doing it, I'm doing it at the materials level because it's easier. Um, it's also a lot easier to understand than putting the customs code. I can put the customs code here for a brass standoff or for a standoff. Very exciting. You guys would not know what that number means. The 84182100 at the start is probably confusing enough. So I'd rather use the materials one for the example. So metal, copper metal alloy, lead between 1% to 5%. Then you have to put the safe use information. Now, safe use is not mandatory. The only mandatory requirement is the article and the SVHC. But they'll be pushing hard to put the safe use. And a lot of those substances will have generally the same safe use instructions. Um, advice to workers, like wear respiratory protection, avoid direct contact with skin during use, keep out of reach of children, do not mix in municipal waste, waste incineration is recommended, which is more common for the bioaccumulants. In practice, carcinogens will often use the same ones. Reproductive toxins will use the same ones. Endocrine disruptors use the same ones. Bioaccumulants use the same ones. Respiratory sensitizers use the same ones. And it's not 100% enforced. It's not that enforceable which ones you choose anyways. And you might change a little bit if it's the exposure difference is contact versus inhalation versus disposal, uh, whether the use is installation. So a lot of SVHC exposures during installation, often it's the 
person installing the device that touches the most of the SBHCs as opposed to the user, which is not that different than Prop 65. A good portion of the Prop 65 prosecutions we defend. So most of Prop 65 work we do is proactive, like not getting you in trouble, but definitely we probably do the most work in the business on defense. Somebody has gotten in trouble, usually for blatant reasons, and helping arguing why it isn't so or not so bad. And often the installer's exposure vastly exceeds the consumer exposure. So you take a brass doorstop, which usually has a coating on the outside, and lead and leaded brass you can't touch. And when you install it, when it's on the door, the leaded side, which is on the inside, nobody touches. But the installer can touch it. You know, well, how many can they do? Well, one of the questions is if he's doing an entire Marriott and doing 500 rooms, he could touch a lot. So um, installer exposure is usually a big deal for these things. And you might handle the warnings differently. But similar materials can have similar warnings. Carcinogens one way, reprotoxins one other way, bioaccumulants a different one. So for example, if you add safe use instructions, for example, to these ones, we have the brass standoff again. Um, it's lead, avoid uh, prolonged direct contact with the skin during use, wash hands after contact, keep, reach out, keep out of reach of children, do not mix with municipal waste. Pretty standard stuff. Now, the hands one is fascinating because it's probably the most truthful one. When we do Prop 65 defenses, most Prop 65 prosecutions around ingestion. Strangely enough, oh, that's a vinyl bag. What's it about ingestion? And that's a you know, brass standoff. What's, what's his ingestion? What ends up happening is people touch the brass and the lead comes off in their fingers. And the EPA says the average American doesn't wash their hands enough and on average will touch their mouth eight times between hand washing and about 50% of what's on their fingertips will be ingested. And that's the exposure for mostly for Prop 65. And it's a really neat one. If you ever want to explain this to somebody, you give them a brass component and ask them to roll it around in, your hand, in their hands. Ask them to roll it around in their hands. Well, you explain to them Prop 65 is about the fact when you touch it, it'll get on your fingertips and um, you'll end up not washing your hands enough. And about 50% of what ends up on your fingertips will end up being in your mouth from hand to food contact or hand to cigarette or other fidgeting or touching of the mouth. And then once, the, once you're done explaining that, ask the brass component back. And then ask the person to smell their hands and ask them, what do you smell? And they say, oh, I smell the brass. And you say, exactly. So um, that's one of the big warnings here. It's actually the residue that comes off, especially the lead. The lead comes right off in your fingers. It comes off in your sweat acids. It'll take the lead right out of the brass. And that's why it says avoid prolonged contact and also wash hands after contact. And that's your typical safe use instructions. The silicone's different. It's a bioaccumulant. It's not harmful in itself. It just can't go in the waste stream. Those spaces do not mix with municipal waste, do not flush or pour down drain, which would be very exciting not to do for silicone. Uh, it would be really actually interesting to watch somebody try to flush silicone gaskets down the toilet, but I, you know, probably worse has happened. Um, but this is a typical warning. That's a carcinogen slash reproductive toxin, and this, which is the lead, or the cycloxane, which is a bioaccumulant. So they have different types of safe use. One's about bioaccumulation in the environment. One's about not uh, getting hurt because you touched it. Um, but these are, this is a pretty diff, uh, uh, more specific example. Now, this is the base of the details we have right now. It's, the details are going to change a little bit, but it really is, I mentioned before, based on the current declaration you're supposed to have in the first place. And this is, you're taking your paper declaration and moving into a database form. And again, this is only required for products that contain SVHCs. Now, most complex products contain one or two, especially now with the lead and the cycloxanes, they're super common and everywhere. Um, but the only components you have to declare are the ones that have the SVHCs. So one person mentioned this morning, I've got an engine. That's super complicated. There's tons of components. You don't have to declare tons of components. You only have to declare the ones that have SVHCs in it. And an engine actually doesn't use a lot of PVC. Um, it doesn't survive the, the temperature. You will have a neoprene blended fan belt uh, usually, and that'll have phthalates very commonly. And uh, you won't use silicone usually very often in those situations either. So you end up with having to declare the fan belt or maybe leaded steel if you use leaded steel. Not as common engines either. So worst case scenario, you're usually declaring lead and you're declaring uh, phthalates in the neoprene. And that's it. So even though your product might be super complicated, you only have to declare the articles, that uh, components that have SVHCs in the first place. So uh, a little diversion here. Um, one of the worst things you could do is a full material declaration. Full material declarations are a horrible, horrible, bad idea. Um, mostly, one of the biggest reasons is the data is mostly made up, fabricated invented. There's no quality standard. This is a big part about it. When you get a full material lecture or look at one, so what's the quality standard you apply to it? I'll tell you what it is. The numbers add up to 100%. <laughs> 
I'm a chemist among a variety of other things uh, for my sins. Um, I can read them. Nobody applies a quality standard to them whatsoever. Also, uh, one of the biggest other parts is there's absolutely 100% no future proofing to it or 95% no future proofing to it. Um, because people say, well, you declare 100% of the chemicals. Sure. What's a chemical? Uh, okay. We'll say to do 100% of the cast numbers in it. Oh yeah. Okay. Good. And a cast number, you can hide stuff in it. So most people don't really understand. A lot of people don't understand this. Cast numbers are not pure substances. They're allowed tons of impurities and additives. So PVC, you can see the cast number for PVC, it's flame retardants, it's plasticizers, it's monomers, antioxidants, impurities, stabilizers are not declarable. You could argue it's fillers are, but the rest are not. So example, BPA, styrene, cyclocyloxane, PFOA, SCCPs, and basically all new restricted substances are not declarable full material declaration. There's virtually 95% of new SVHCs that have any applicability in your product will not be declared in a historical uh, full material declaration. The biggest example most recently is the silicones. Silicone's everywhere. Cyclosiloxanes have been there the whole time. They don't have to declare them until it became an SPHC. So the cast number wrote silicone, silicone, or dimethicone. Not thing underneath it. It has no future proofing. Um, it also doesn't allow for alternate, alternative parts. You can't put parts from two different suppliers in it, which is a pretty bad idea when you have two cable harnesses. The data is very non-standardized. There's no rhythm or rhyme to it. And I'll show an example in a, in a minute. It also doesn't handle volatiles. Uh, one of the problems where one of the better not great sources of chemical data, but better, are a safety data sheet for the bare chemical. They often have all this, it's usually in pellet form or spray-on form or flake form, and it has also all the volatiles because it hasn't necessarily been polymerized or whatever else. They don't, they're not there at the end. ADCA is a good example. This is that foaming agent that makes the bubbles in EVA foam, among other types of foam. It'll be 20% of the way of the EVA foam, but once mixture, but once you actually you know, form it, and foam it, it'll be probably sub 0.1% by weight, but it doesn't track that way. What we also did really neat. So one of the things we also do in our lab, we're a big fan of, is inter-operator um, validation. Two people doing the same thing should get the same answer. So what we do for each SVHC is when people do full material data gathering for something, and another person doing guesswork by just searching uh, the internet and um, looking at risks, and or just making a guess of what SVHC is. And then we tested it. And the guesswork is way more accurate than the full material declaration ever was. It's kind of funny. You can do, for SVHCs, you can do guesswork, educate guesswork even better, and do way better than the full material declaration ever to do. So here's an example. Here are two parts, and I'm sorry if this is your part. I just picked two things that are publicly available. They're the exact same part. They're a case tantalum capacitors. They're identical. Two different manufacturers, identical. But if you look at the full material declaration, you would not be able to tell they're identical. There's nothing in common, really, between them. There's tantalum. That's it. But in reality, they're identical. So one of the neat things on the right, it's all by element. Tantalum, manganese, silver, oxygen, carbon, fluorine. So all the polymers are not there. And they did it by cast numbers. I told you. It's cast number. They did all the cast numbers by elemental. Again, there are no real rules. The one on the left, you can see, is a lot more detail. And you go, oh, it's better. Yeah, but they have epoxy resin. Look down at the bottom. Phenol resin. Everything in it is hidden. Stabilizers are flame retards. Everything is hidden underneath it. So in the future, imagine epoxy resin, they... Um, one of its additives is an SVHC. You never know from the full material. You have to regather the data. It's a hugely effort for not doing anything consistent. So again, it's a horribly, horrible, bad idea. Um, there are a couple of things full material declarations are great at. Being an example in software demos. Oh my goodness. You got a software demo and you got a full material declaration or a fake one for four or five parts and you show how they add up together and you get to little, little reds and greens appear. The fact you found an SVHC or an ROHS substance, awesome. Great, for example. They're also fantastic for selling software to equipment manufacturers. It's, it's the main use. And causing product recalls. We've dealt with a disproportionate, surprising even to us, how many product recalls we've done related to people who got full material declarations and didn't realize what the cast numbers were saying or not saying, or the data was manufactured. The fact they have an alternative supplier anyways, and they're a problem. Um, one of the most common ones is CP52. Chlorinated paraffin, 52%. It's theoretically somewhat analogous to medium chain chlorinated paraffins, but it isn't. It's chlorinated paraffins controlled at 52% chlorine, which means it's got like every chlorinated paraffin you can imagine there. And about 20% of its SCCPs, and there's the SCCP into the product causing the recall. And the most times CP52 wouldn't be added anyways because it's an extender. It's an additive to an additive inside PVC. And since it's by cast number, not even regulated today, you wouldn't see it. So, um, 
product recall. We also have problems with people using the alternative names for hexavalent chromium, and that's sneaking through all the time. Uh, it's amazing how many hex chrome failures we still get. It dominates. It's now surpassed lead as the main RHS failure. So again, about us, uh, we're part of the highest volume lab, one of the highest volume ones for complex products. A lot of people really get smaller parts. We do complex things in North America, a lot of reach SPHC testing, uh, ROHS, Prop 65, POP, which is the SCCP. It, actually, it's funny, in terms of ones that are gonna come back to bite you, uh, other than Prop 65, it's the SCCPs and POP. We've tested thousands of complex products for reach SBHC. Uh, we do this all the time. All we need to do the testing is either a picture or a web link or a description. Just we need to know what it is. And we can tell you how much and how long. We're really good at this. The other one is like, you have, oh, I have a lot of products. I don't even know where to start or like kind of started. I think we have a decent program, but I'm not 100% sure about it. One of easily most popular and probably our best reviewed and rated and is our SBHC onsite. We come there, we do a little less than half a day education like this. What are the rules? Just a little bit slower and not at Mach 2, and I apologize for that, especially if you're not English first language. I apologize. I'm going a little fast. I'm trying to keep the content all in play. Uh, I still want to get to the Q&A. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please submit it into the questions, and I'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, but the on-site won't be quite as fast speaking, I hope. So we do a lot of education, explain the rules, and be very practical about your products. And this is what you do for your product, and this is what other people in your space are doing. This is actually what's working, as opposed to what people are doing in your space and is doing a horrible job, which, by the way, is fairly common. Um, and then we do half a day about product evaluation and declaration writing, where we actually evaluate the products with you, like, like hands-on. We actually physically have the product apart and say, hey, it's this component and that component. This is the risk, the SVHC of risk, and this is how we declare it. And be very tangible to you and your engineering and your, your um, design team, where they can be much tangible. We find it so much easier to understand and remember and retain and leverage if it's tangible. So it's half the day, a little less than half the day in education, and the rest of the half on tangible. And then based on these risks, we write the SVHC declaration. Again, you don't. It's not restricted. You just have to say that it's there or maybe there. And as long as you communicate it, you're compliant. So we write the SVHC, de SVHC declaration. Not only gets you up to a much higher level of compliance, but it provides a much better knowledge foundation to leverage and maintain against a wider product range. New products normally have a compliance budget. Legacy products, not so hot. And you often have a lot of products that are very similar. So we help you through that. So again, uh, we do a lot of testing. We're happy to we test pretty well anything. We also do EU MDR. Um, tremendous amount of volume here. It's a pretty good process and quite fast and cost effective because we do so much of it and a very refined way to do it. But super popular, never goes wrong. The training and education, the one day onsite, half a day education, half a day product evaluation, hands-on, tangible, touching things. You'll probably never have anything like it again. Uh, unless you have us for a different substance. We also talk about Prop 65 usually at the same time saying, hey, this cable likely is DIMP, which is a long chain orthophthalate, non reach SVHC, not a ROHS, but likely a Prop 65. And this is how it's prosecuted, this is how it comes off, and this is how you put the warning on it for it. And if you want to control it, this is how you control it. So I'm about to get into Q&A. Before I get into that, of course, everybody who registered, not just attended, will get a copy of the slides. And um, we should have a recording of this up on our website. Uh, hopefully by the end of uh, the week. We should be usually pretty good about that. Yeah, perfectly good about that. We'll try. But again, if you have any questions, please submit it. I had tons earlier today. Uh, what is high-risk materials? That is awesome. So um, one of the ways we look at it, we don't necessarily go, go looking for DHP. We don't go looking for lead. We identify what materials make up the product and what SVHCs are likely in there. Especially when you're doing a risk evaluation like the on-site, where of course you're just having to declare, it's not banned, you don't have to be sure, you just have to declare it. So high-risk materials are ones that are likely to contain it. Uh, phthalates are a problem for reach, won't they be an issue for ROHS? Yes, at different time frames. So uh, regular electronics, uh, the main orthophthalates, the reach SVHC orthophthalates, the ROHS orthophthalates, are restricted as July of this year. However, medical and IVD and control monitoring have until 2021. So, and then certain product types, like aviation, RHS does not apply, but reach SVHC still does. Great question. Is lead in high melting temperature solder declarable? Yes. Lead in alloys. Lead in glass is not. Certain lead salts are in lead and salts, but lead in alloys, so lead as lead, lead as an alloy in solder or as an alloy in brass or aluminum or steel are all declarable as lead SVHC. What standard do you use to conduct testing for SVHC? Well, that's a really interesting question because most of 
uh, the SVHCs do not have a specific test data. So what we actually do is we do screening. We've had to work in a heck of a lot of validation. And we talked earlier about our SCCP uh, screening validation test, that huge project where we tested across five countries. We didn't do it for fun. We were validating a screening test um, that helps us refine. We can easily screen out parts that do not have SCCPs and the ones left over that potentially have SCCPs, we do GCMS. And the test standard for every single SCC almost differs, um, but we usually use a screening up front, which is really effective and weeds out most of the materials and parts. It's a lot more effective. Products with SVGs registered by January 5th, 2021. Um, does this apply to mixtures or reagents? No. Chemicals that are governed by the safety data sheet still use the safety data sheet as communication. This is for products that do not have a safety data sheet, so physical products. Do you believe that products that converted with a new revision with a, to remove an SVG will need to be declared separately as two products with this revision or on the latest version be kept in the database? That's a fantastic question. A revision control in the database. We do not know. Um, at the moment, the way it looks like, if your product no longer has the SVHC, you revise it and the old version disappears. Um, the other part of our revisions is going to be really interesting, and that's what some of the fine detail that has to come out, is you're required to update your SVHC declaration within a year of a new SVHCs coming out. So the first year, you have a year's grace, and then on, it's every six months. You have it, but when a new SVHC comes out, like the really confusing one coming out, probably this June, is TMPP with greater than 0.1% nonalphenol, which is a very complicated definitional problem. Um, when, if it gets on the list, you have a year before you have to declare. They might change that number, but currently it's at a year. It could be six months, but we're probably going to go with a year. When you update it, does it remove the old version? Good question. There's been no comments in the database so far about revision control. So at the moment, if you update it, it looks like it just replaces. What component distributors need to register in the database? Anyone, so legally, anyone who transfers a product or a component to a recipient inside the EU will have to submit those components in the SVHC database if they contain SVHCs. You legally don't have to do it if they don't contain SVHCs. But if you transfer it from one person to another, whether by sale or otherwise, um, you'll, inside the European Union, you have to lit, register it or will have to submit it in the system if it contains an SVHC above 0.1% by weight in any component. That said, what you're often going to see is sometimes um, manufacturers are going to come and say, look, I buy all these parts from you. I want the database ID. This is the unique ID number for everything um, for all your parts. And I give you an Excel sheet. So a lot of cases, especially if they get bulk upload capability, there is a technical motivation, just upload everything you have, including all the components that do not contain SVHCs in the system, just so when people ask for data for them, you can just provide the unique ID. How can you explain how REACH folds in the upcoming MDR compliance deadlines? Uh, so REACH regulation is wholly separate, not only from the medical device regulation, but wholly separate from C marking in total. Now, they will use a lot of the same definition from C marking surveillance. And one of the big changes you're going to see coming up is the C marking uh, governing market surveillance enforcement regulations are being changed or directives. And you're going to see um, a new term called economic operator, where all products need an economic operator inside the European Union for compliance reasons. So it can be the manufacturer with an office in the EU. The manufacturer, in absence of words, a manufactured by the product is the brand owner of the product. So you can have a design and made, and made in someone else's factory, but once you put your name on it, you're the manufacturer. So it can be a manufacturer's office inside the EU. It can be the importer of the product in the EU. It can be a fulfillment provider that's agreed to take on responsibility, or it could be an authorized representative inside the EU that's agreed to take on responsibility, but it has to be inside the EU. And so the REACH is likely to absorb some of the same concepts where you need to have, even for this, now it isn't off the bat in the database, um, a contact in the European Union. The current version doesn't look like that. So the deadlines are different. MDR does reference REACH, especially for endocrine disruptors, which are really only defined through the SVHC process today. Um, but they're to totally separate with two totally separate deadlines. The reach, the MDR deadline is basically May of 2020, sort of. And what I mean by sort of, if your product is still on a valid M medical device directive certificate, it can let that directive certificate expire. 
with some with some limitations. Um, this one is Jan 5th, 2021. It's declarables. It is medical devices are in it. And even had mentioned QR codes directly in the database form. So um, they're totally unrelated. They just happen to have a lot of chemicals in common. For the most part, most CM category one known to cause cancer mutation reproductive harm, CMRs, and endocrine disruptors that would be regulated under UMDR are almost all also uh, reach SVHCs. Do you just have to have the reach SVHC available upon request? Do we have to, we don't have to include it with each shipment. Today, there are no specific rules. One of the common arguments is, is manufacturers say, look, it changes all the time. We keep it on hand, so when somebody asks for it, we provide it. And that's one of the most common ones, to keep it on hand. Very few companies provide it pro proactively. And if a national authority comes to you for enforcement, they'll ask you, I want your REACH SVHC declaration, or would like it, they're nicer than that. Um, and as long as you can provide it, you're compliant. So one of the most common ones is to have it available. As a carbon steel and stainless steel supplier, it does not seem to have SVHCs that need to be declared. Very likely. Um, so it, most metal alloys do not have declarable SVHCs. The exception is if you have lead and, or cadmium, and in the future, cobalt. Cobalt is being reclassified as a Category 1 CMR. It'll eventually have to be, it'll eventually very likely end up being, uh, once it gets recategorized, within the next year, it'll be an SVHC. So cobalt could be the next SVHC, and you might see it for certain steels. Um, cobalt is rarer steel, but it, it could be there. Otherwise, you don't. Now, you may choose to declare in the database for some of your products just to make your life easier. People keep asking for IDs, because once you've registered once, as long as you just give them your ID, your life is easy. It's actually a very easy way to provide data. But if you do not have an SVHC in your product, like most carbon steel and stainless steels do not, you normally don't have to register. Also, if your product is still governed by a safety data sheet, like it's raw steel, then you also don't because it's not an article yet. Uh, tons of questions. Uh, I didn't get to all of them. I apologize, ran a little bit over time. Um, if you have any more questions, please feel free to contact me. Also, if you want help with SVHCs, um, we'd love to help. We're pretty darn good at this, I'd like to think. I'm super biased, though. Um, and great hosting everyone again. And again, everybody who registered received a copy of this, the slides. It might take a little while uh, because we send them out manually, and there are a lot of uh, registrants, which is pretty flattering and pretty awesome. Um, and the recording should be available by the end of the week, maybe faster. Thank you very much, and a pleasure hosting everyone again.